Hi, Pastor Blair here, and I'm so glad that you've tuned in to use this resource, and we hope and pray that it's a blessing for you. We also pray that you would use this resource in conjunction with and participation in your local church. Discipleship was never meant to be done in isolation, and this resource was never meant to replace your participation and involvement in your local church. The local church is where we grow, and we grow as disciples of Jesus, and we see the forward progress of the gospel in our lives. Now, if this resource has been helpful for you, would you consider giving back to help us continue to make resources and continue to develop the quality of our resources? You can give financially at compassregina.com. And most importantly, we just treasure and covet your prayers. All right, so uh, Good Friday was, was, uh, has passed. Sunday is now here. Good Friday, as terrible as that was, it marked the culmination of Jesus' plan to save his people from their sins. Amen? Right, so so happy, happy Easter. This is a good day. And i got to see some smiles out there, even though I can't see your faces. I'm sure it's happening, all right? I see a few. That's good. That's good. So in the Christian faith, as Murray talked about, Easter is the oldest Christian uh, holiday. It's the most important day of the year. It's the significance of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, the events upon all of which Christianity is based. Every human being on the planet is impacted by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is risen? All right, he is risen? All right, that's, that's the, early st- the standard early greeting of the early church. When two Christians would meet, they would, um, they would remember the glorious fact that Jesus died and he rose again, that he's... He, that he has authority in heaven on earth. He has authority over death, hell, and the grave. Jesus conquered sin, Satan, and death. And that's what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. So whenever Christians would meet, they, one would greet and they would say, uh, he is risen, and then the other people would respond. Yeah. All right, all right. What we celebrate today is the greatest day in the history of the world. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die." Yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. See, Christianity is is the wake of what happened after the resurrection. The whole book of Acts that follows that 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 precedes or follows the life of Jesus and his death and burial and resurrection, the book of Acts follows, and the book of Acts is about the, the, the Christianity, what was left in the wake of the resurrection. It's about the early church. And, and after Jesus' death, Christianity didn't fall apart. Don't you find that interesting? In fact, it actually exploded. It exploded. In the course of about 300 years, Christianity had, had spread throughout the entire Roman Empire. And what made Christianity different than all other messianic movements that took place throughout history it is because of what happened after the leader of that movement was killed. Jesus was killed, he died, he rose again, and as a result, the world was turned upside down. The world is still being turned upside down. You know, some of the places in the world where you think Christianity is not flourishing, like a place like Iran, for example, is one of the fastest places on the earth where Christianity is spreading. The resurrection of Jesus is turning the world and has turned the world upside down. And the issue of Easter is really profoundly simple. And it all boils down to this. If Jesus is dead, then Christianity is dead. If Jesus is alive, then Christianity is alive. Paul said so much in 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 17. He said, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. No one can remain neutral regarding Jesus' resurrection. The claim is too staggering, the event is too earth-shaking, the implications are too significant, and the matter is too serious. Jesus either rose from the dead, or he, he didn't. In resurrecting Jesus from the, in, from the grave, God reminds us of his absolute, unshakable reign and rule over life and death. As a a Christ follower, we're shaped by the fact that our God became man, what we celebrate at Christmas, the incarnation. He died for our sins, what we celebrate on Good Friday, and was resurrected on the third day. This is today, the Resurrection Sunday. The grave could not hold him. 
He lives. He sits today at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul explains in detail the importance, the radical importance of the resurrection of Christ. And he gives six disastrous consequences if there is no resurrection. Let me just read for you 1 Corinthians 15, and then we'll look at it a little bit more closely. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, some, though some have fallen asleep, which is a way of saying they've died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he, also, he, he appeared to me also. Now here's, as we look at this, and, and you look at the, the entire passage of 1 Corinthians 15, here's the six disastrous consequences if Jesus did not rise from the dead. The first one is preaching Christ would be senseless. Here, this morning, utterly pointless. In verse 14 of, of 1 Corinthians 15, it says, And if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. So faith would also be useless. Preaching would be useless. Faith would be useless. Faith in Christ would be useless. The third one is, is all the witnesses and the preachers of the resurrection would be liars. So you, you would be a liar if the resurrection were not true. Verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God, and he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. The fourth one, no one would be redeemed from sin. Verse 17, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Fifthly, all former believers would have perished. Verse 18, then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And, and sixth, finally, what Paul's unpacking here, six disastrous consequences if there's no, no resurrection. Christians would be the most pitied people on the earth. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So in Adam, sin entered the world, and in Christ we have been redeemed from the penalty and the wrath of sin, and Jesus paved a way for us to have reconciled relationship with God. See, the resurrection is the victory for every believer. The resurrection of Jesus demonstrates that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. It proves that God has the power to raise us from the dead. And it guarantees that all those who believe in Jesus will not remain dead, but are resurrected into eternal life. And that's our blessed hope. That's what makes Resurrection Sunday so amazing as to remember that hope that we have through the resurrected Christ. And, and because of that future, it changes everything on how we live in the present. So, for example, why is it hard to face suffering? Why is it hard to face disability or disease? Why is it hard to do the right thing if you know it's going to cost you money or reputation or maybe even your own life? Why is it so hard to face your death or the death of loved ones? It's hard because... We think this broken world is the only world we're ever going to have. It's easy to feel as if money is the only wealth we're ever going to have. As if our body is the only body we're ever going to have. But if Jesus is risen, then your future is so much more beautiful and so much more certain than that. John Stott said this, Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. And if you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. See, apart from the resurrection, Jesus Christ, apart from his resurrection, there is no Savior. There's no salvation, there's no forgiveness of sin, and there's no hope of resurrected eternal life. 
Apart from the resurrection, Jesus is reduced to yet another good but dead man and therefore of no cons- consequence or, or considerable help to us in this life or in the next. Without the resurrection of Jesus, a few billion people today who worship Jesus as God are gullible fools. And our hope for a resurrection life after this life is the hope of silly fools who trust in a dead man to give them life. See, the historical evidence for the resurrection is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. But you could have all the evidence in the world that that he was in fact resurrected, but that may not lead you to this important question. Why is the resurrection of Christ so important? Through Jesus' resurrection, he has life-giving power to forgive and transform our lives today. The resurrection transforms our lives by giving us a new authority, a new identity, and a new mission. So that's what we want to look at this morning. We're not going to go through all the evidence of the resurrection. We could be here for months. We're going to look at these three things, among many things that the resurrection accomplished for us. It gave us a new identity, it gave us a new authority, it gave us a new mission. That's, what we're going to, that's where we're going to go this morning. In the wake of the resurrection, as Jesus uh, um, rose from the dead and he met with his followers, in the wake of his resurrection, he gave us what's called the Great Commission. And the best example, the best scripture that we're most familiar with of the Great Commission, even though it's found in Mark 16 and in the Gospels, the one that we're most familiar with is Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Let me read that for you. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So these are the final words of Jesus before he was taken up into heaven. And it explains to us how how to live the resurrected life and speaks to the benefits that faith produces in us. In talking with his disciples, Jesus, his disciples and the, those that were gathered, he's, he's telling them how to be fruitful and how to multiply in their new life in Christ. So the resurrected life begins with him and his words. So in Matthew 28, in this great commission, this great uh, directive for us, Jesus describes a life characterized by a new authority, a new identity, and a new mission. So let's look at these uh, one at a time. The first one is the resurrection produces a new authority in our lives. Jesus made this audacious claim. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth. So all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So this claim of authority eclipses that of kings and leaders of nations. The, The kings and the leaders of nations will die. Think about how many leaders throughout history who've had significant authority are now dead. Because of of Jesus' resurrection, he conquered death, and Jesus' rule goes beyond this earth and into the heavens. So Jesus becomes our new authority. Because of the cross and the resurrection, we have a restored relationship, and that relationship puts God back into his rightful place in our lives, as the ultimate authority of our lives. The ultimate authority for our lives is Christ and Christ alone. It's his word, his revealed word to us. That's the authority by which our lives, not, 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 not civil government, that's not our ultimate authority. Our ultimate authority is the authority given to all in, in heaven and on, of all the earth, given to Jesus and Jesus alone. First, or C- Colossians 1, 17 to 20, describes the lordship of Jesus like this. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, 
making peace by the blood of his cross. See, the scope of Jesus' authority has no boundaries. Now, here's what that means for us. Here's what this means, that the resurrection produces a new authority in our lives. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, all of it. There's no one more deserving of our worship and obedience than Jesus. So when you become a Christian, here's what that means. You are submitting your desire to be in charge, and you're acknowledging that Jesus is in charge. And because he's in charge, you follow him. You're obedient to him. You listen to his words. You listen to his teachings. You align your life in obedience to his commands because Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, in the beginning of Scripture, in Genesis chapter 3, in that story of Adam and Eve and sin that entered the garden, we sought to remove ourselves from under God's authority. Why? Why? So that we can be in charge. Who doesn't like to be in charge? I mean, I think we we all like to be in charge. But the resurrected life is continually putting Jesus back in his rightful place. And we submit to him and his rule alone. A disciple of Jesus learns to submit to him in every area of our lives. Every facet of our lives is under his authority. Work, school, marriage, relationships, money, talents, everything. So living the resurrected life is placing yourself under Jesus' rule. He's in charge and he's good at what he does. The empty tomb reveals to us that God is powerful. He's powerful in his authority. He's powerful in his strength. Think of the authority you would have, or think of the authority that that it would take to have control in all situations, locations, relationships, in order to guarantee that Jesus would come at the precise moment and do what he is appointed to do. Also, could there be a more pointed demonstration of power than to have power over death? The grave, the tomb was empty. He's not here. By God's awesome power, Jesus took off his grave clothes and walked out of the tomb. Perhaps you wrestle with your doubts. You might be wired in such a way that you kind of look at the cost benefit of trusting Jesus. You, you might even write down the pros and cons list. Well, let me save you some time and tell you it will always, it will always come out the same. The cost of submitting to Jesus pales in comparison with the rich relationship and the future that you have in Christ when you submit to his authority over your own. Secondly, the resurrection makes us a new creation and gives us a new identity. So the resurrection gives us a new authority that we fall under, but it also gives us a new identity. So resurrection life is nothing short of an entirely new identity, an entirely new identity. We become new creations, Scripture tells us. The old is gone, the new has come. For those who live in Christ, we are new creations, and we live out of the infinite resources of his authority and his compassion. Now, how might you fill in this? How might you fill in the blank to this statement? I am blank. Now, it's Easter Sunday, and you, you're probably thinking, oh, well, I'm, a, I'm a child of God, Right? That's, that's, that's true, but often I don't think that. Often I think, oh, I am what I do, I am what I eat, I am what, whatever, right? We often think about this. Uh, we, we are in what we do. You know, I make money, so therefore I am whatever, or I wear this, or I look like that, or I came from whatever, and that's my, where my identity is rooted. How we view ourselves is often tied to how we're doing in various areas of our life. I'm a mess, and I'm amazed at how easily it is from one minute to the next to have my identity rooted in the wrong things. A stable sense of self cannot fully exist when we place our identity in external things, because external things change, circumstances change, our identity therefore constantly changes with them when our identity is rooted in those ever-changing things. The resurrected life is so radically different. 
Instead of being named by the things we've done, we are named in the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So our identity is defined by God's utter success over our sinful failures and a gift of new life. Just, just listen to, to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians is a great book around identity. It says this, according to Ephesians 1, that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. We've been chosen, we've been adopted, redeemed, forgiven, grace lavished and unconditionally loved and accepted. We are pure, blameless, forgiven. We have received the hope of spending eternity with God. When we are in Christ, these aspects of our identity can never be altered by what we do. You eat too much, you feel fat, you're still loved and accepted. You, you uh, lash out at your spouse, you're still blameless and forgiven. You're adopted, you're chosen. These things are not contingent on our circumstances. We are a new creation, we're given a new identity. Jesus' final words in Matthew 28, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with us always. Now, just think about that for a minute. The ultimate benefit of following Jesus is Jesus himself. The ultimate benefit of following Jesus is Jesus himself. We enjoy daily relationship with him. And as Jesus is teaching and he's preparing his disciples for what is to come, his death and resurrection, Jesus tells his disciples that he would send to them the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, the story of the beginning of the church, like I said, the Holy Spirit comes and it empowers normal people to follow Jesus, boldly follow Jesus, and, and we see the, the Holy Spirit empowering people to speak the gospel in ways that had never been done, to obey Jesus' commands, to heal, to make disciples, to give freely and generously. The Holy Spirit is called our, our comforter and our counselor in Scripture. The Holy Spirit is God's Red Bull for your life. It's empowering you for the ministry that God has called you to do. The Holy Spirit is the divine person who possesses resurrection power and makes that power available to you and to me. In Romans 8, 11, it says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The power of the resurrection is ours. Amen? It's alive in us through the spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is at work in us. He's enabling us to live the resurrected life. The Holy Spirit bears the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and and self-control. It's the Holy Spirit that develops our character to become more like Jesus. You don't have to muster up the strength to follow Jesus. Like you have to muster up the strength to get out of bed in the morning. Instead, you rely on the strength of the Spirit of God who's freely given to us as our counselor and our comforter. You're relying on the strength of the Spirit of God that is, it, is at work within us shaping us more and more to reflect to the world around us the Savior, our King. So the resurrection makes us a new creation and gives us a new identity. It gives us a new authority. And finally, the resurrection empowers us here and now in this life for the mission that God's called us to. So you can think about it this way. Up, in, and out. It's a good way to, to remember this. God's given us a new authority up. He's given us a new identity in. And he's given us uh, a new mission out. Up, in, and out. So Jesus gave us the marching orders. It came from, from his mouth, from the man who came to give his life as a ransom for many to save us who are his enemies. See, ironically, our orders are to invite others through imitation. So our mission is to make disciples through words and actions. The gospel is something to be heralded. It's to be spoken. 
Yes, it's through our actions, and our actions tell people what it is that we, that we believe. It, it, when, we, when people see our lives, they understand, they begin to see a glimpse into the worldview to which our lives uh, are, are living through, the lens by which we see the world. So our actions matter, but so do our words. But so do our words. See, the power of the resurrection doesn't end with us. It travels through us. We're, we're called in Scripture, we're ambassadors. And we're, we're inviting people in, we're inviting people to, to, to join in God's redemptive agenda to restore human flourishing. We're inviting people into the resurrection power that comes through Jesus' resurrection. So we are sent into the world to share the good news that Jesus defeated sin, death, and evil through his own death and resurrection. That Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself. Jesus is calling his followers to participate in his work of renewal. Eugene Peterson said, we are God's advertisement to the world. We are God's advertisement to the world. What does that advertisement look like in your life? See, we're a trailer of things to come. We're called to transmit a a bottom-up indigenous Christianity for all people and all cultures. The first shall become last and the last shall become first. That is God's economy. Discipleship is the engine that drives the mission. Discipleship is the engine that drives the mission. So as, as Christ followers, we've been drafted into this unique mission of God. Jesus has chosen us to be his agents of reconciliation, his ambassadors. This is not our home. The Bible calls us ministers of reconciliation. We're sharing in his mission of healing all of creation because we experience intimate fellowship with God through Christ. We are also partners with him in his mission in the world. Discipleship drives the mission as agents of reconciliation. So Jesus informs our resurrected life. He gives us a new and gracious authority up, a new identity in, and a new mission out. Up, in, and out. In the book, Raised, Finding Jesus by Doubting the Resurrection, the authors write, and I want to conclude with this this morning. They say, the resurrection, like a river, seems impossible to cross when you first come to the riverbank. You can see the other side and it looks good, but you aren't sure how to get there. But there is a ferry there as well, subtly hidden off to the side. Will you take the ferry of faith across the river of doubt? Will you redirect your faith to the radiant Jesus? And when you do, you are transported to the other side, through no doing of your own, right into the resurrection. Jesus carries you there, where you begin to experience the benefits of the resurrected life right away. A new authority, a gracious king, a new identity, and a new purpose on his mission of joining God in the renewal of all things. By faith, Jesus' death and resurrection can become your death and resurrection, releasing you to truly live life. Best of all, when we turn away from trusting our unreliable selves to turn to the reliable, resurrected Christ, we gain intimacy with the most beautiful, powerful, creative, and gracious person the world will ever know. Life with Jesus is better. He he offers deeper joy, more profound meaning, and true purpose. Life with Jesus is truer. He is the one we're made for. And if you join Jesus, you will join the person who changes everything, even us. He is risen. He is risen. That's good news. As we take communion together this morning, you remember the... uh, the scripture that says, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? When we take communion this morning on this Resurrection Sunday, we're reminded again of the great sacrifice that was made for us that, so that we might enjoy a, with Jesus the resurrected life, that we might have a new authority, a new identity, and a new mission. So as we take communion together, let's take communion with thanksgiving because death, where is your victory? 
Death, where is your sting? Let's partake together. On this Resurrection Sunday, let's worship. Let's worship, continue to worship together as we sing together. Man, we, we got a, an amazing Jesus that we get to worship. He's risen. The, the grave is empty.